Hello everyone. Welcome to the Flight 93 National Memorial. My name is Paul Donati. I am a volunteer ambassador here at the National Memorial. I've been doing this now for six and a half years. As you all know, on the morning of September 11th, 2001, terrorists hijacked four aircraft with the intention of flying them into four major targets within the United States. And again, as you all know, three of those aircraft reached their target. The fourth, United Airlines Flight 93, did not reach its target. And again, as you probably all know, the reason Flight 93 did not reach its target was because the passengers and crew of Flight 93 made the decision to fight back, to try to regain control of that aircraft. What I'd like to do this morning is just tell you some more information about 9-11 and more specifically about Flight 93, things that you may not know. The story of Flight 93 is one that the more you know, the more amazing it becomes, and the more you know, the more you will deeply honor and respect and have gratitude for what these people, these 40 people on Flight 93 did not only for us and for the country, but really for the whole world. Before I get into that, one of the ways that we honor the passengers and crew of Flight 93 here at the National Memorial is by telling their individual stories. So I'd just like briefly to tell you about two of the flight attendants that were on Flight 93. Lorraine Bay was 58 years old. She was in her 37th year as a flight attendant, and she ranked fourth in seniority among over 700 flight attendants at the Newark, New Jersey airport. She was known as the card lady because she sent cards to everyone and everybody for every reason. And as a matter of fact, Two of her ill colleagues received cards from Lorraine after her death that were postmarked September 11th. So one of the last things that Lorraine Bay did before boarding Flight 93 that morning was an act of love and caring by sending two sick co-workers get well cards. Lorraine always carried a corkscrew on every flight just so she could more quickly and easily assist passengers who needed a corkscrew. That corkscrew was found here in the wreckage of Flight 93 and eventually returned to her husband, Eric, who then donated it to be on display at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum in New York. So if you get a chance to get to New York and go to the museum, look for Lorraine Bay's corkscrew in the Flight 93 section. Another flight attendant was C.C. Ross Lyles. C.C. Ross Lyles had been a police officer and detective in Fort Pierce, Florida for six years, and she was very good at her job. She even recruited her future husband, Lorne, to the police force. Each of them had sons from a previous marriage and Lorne has said that their blended family was meant to be because all five sons were Jays, Jordan, Jerome, Javon, Justin, and Jarrell. But CeCe's dream job was to become a flight attendant, so she made the decision to switch careers, and in January of 2001, she completed her training as a flight attendant for United Airlines. CC made calls from uh, Flight 93 on the morning of 9-11. She very calmly and professionally um, reported what she was witnessing and the, the, the activities of the terrorists. I think we can attribute that calm, professional demeanor to her training as a police officer and detective in Fort Pierce, Florida. And Lorne has said that having CC's remains here at the Flight 93 National Memorial is like having CC in the backyard of heaven. So let's get into 9-11 and then more specifically Flight 93. The terrorists chose four aircraft 
that were scheduled to take off within a small window of time so that the four attacks would happen within a small window of time. They chose four aircraft that were early morning, nonstop, East Coast to West Coast flights so that they would be fully loaded with fuel. At 7.59 a.m., American 11 took off from Boston. It was destined for Los Angeles. American 11 took off fairly close to on time and was hijacked fairly quickly after takeoff, turned around and pointed towards its target, which was the North Tower of the World Trade Center. 15 minutes later, United 175 took off, also from Boston, also destined for Los Angeles. United 175 also took off fairly close to on time, was hijacked fairly quickly after takeoff, turned around and pointed towards its target, which was the South Tower of the World Trade Center. Just six minutes later, American 77 took off from Dulles Airport down by DC. American 77, also destined for Los Angeles, also took off fairly close to on time and was also hijacked fairly quickly after takeoff, turned around, pointed towards its target, which was the Pentagon. So three of the aircraft took off close to on time and also were hijacked pretty quickly after takeoff. Now, Flight 93. Flight 93 was scheduled to depart Newark, New Jersey. If any of you have ever flown out of Newark, New Jersey, uh, you probably did not fly on time. Newark was, and I believe still is, known for flight delays. Flight 93, scheduled to depart Newark, destined for San Francisco, was late. The first of two very important delays with Flight 93 occurred in Newark. They did not take off until 8.42 a.m. So right off the bat, Flight 93 was behind that small window of time that the terrorist had wanted. They took off at 8.42. Just four minutes later, at 8.46 a.m., American 11 struck the North Tower in New York. So some of the people on Flight 93 may have been some of the last people to see the Twin Towers prior to being attacked. Because when you take off from Newark, you can see Manhattan. So if you were paying attention that morning and you heard about this plane flying into the World Trade Center, you probably thought it was some weird accident. How in the world could that happen? It was clear blue sky all across the country that morning. But 17 minutes later at 9.03 a.m., and 9.03 is a very important time for the morning of 9.11, at 9.03 a.m., United 175 struck the South Tower of the World Trade Center. And at 9.03, when that happened, that's when we all knew that first one was no accident, that these were deliberate attacks. So 9.03 a.m. Then at 9.37 a.m., American 77 struck the Pentagon. So now I said there were two important delays with Flight 93. The first occurred in Newark with taking off. They were delayed taking off, which puts, put them right be, behind the terrorist intended timeline. Second important delay. As I said, the other three flights were all hijacked fairly quickly after takeoff, not Flight 93. For whatever reason, and we will probably never know why, the hijackers on Flight 93 waited 46 very important minutes before they hijacked that plane. They waited from takeoff at 8.42 all the way until 9.28 a.m. So now by 9.28, not only was Flight 93 even further behind that intended terrorist timeline, that intended uh, window of time, but Flight 93 was now far, 
from its target. In those 46 minutes, Flight 93 had time to fly all the way from Newark across New Jersey, all the way across Pennsylvania, and they were near the Pennsylvania-Ohio border when they were finally hijacked at 928. And then they flew even a little further west towards Cleveland before they finally turned the plane around, pointed it in a southeasterly direction towards Washington, D.C. What I'd like to do now is try to have you understand possibly what the passengers and crew of Flight 93 uh, may have been experiencing when they were hijacked at 9.28 a.m. You know, anytime you fly, you feel a little bit of turbulence. It makes you uneasy, maybe even a little afraid. Well, what the passengers and crew of Flight 93 experienced was far more than a little bit of mild turbulence. When they were hijacked, the plane immediately dropped 700 feet in altitude and began flying erratically. So just try to imagine. Within a few minutes, and this happened on all four planes that morning, the terrorists forced all of the passengers and crew into the back of the plane. They threatened them with a bomb, which was a lie. They told them, sit still, don't do anything stupid. We are going back to the airport to have our demands met. Again, another lie. But if you were on one of those planes that morning, you would believe it because that is exactly the way hijackings worked prior to 9-11. So again, try to imagine your plane drops 700 feet in altitude. Your plane starts flying erratically. You are threatened with a bomb, and then you come to find out your plane has been hijacked, all within the space of a few minutes. So what do the passengers and crew of Flight 93 do? They start to make phone calls. Back then, they had those air phones on the back seats of planes. Uh, you could use a credit card to make a phone call. They are not yet aware of what has happened in New York. They are calling just to tell their loved ones they're on a hijacked plane. Apparently, the terrorist did nothing to stop them. It's possible that the terrorists did not realize at this point just how far behind that timeline they were. It's possible the terrorists did not realize at this point how far they were from their target. And they absolutely did not realize that those phone calls would make all the difference. So the passengers and crew of Flight 93 start to make their phone calls, they, telling their loved ones their, their plane has been hijacked. By this time, though, it's 9.35 or 9.40, somewhere in there, more than a half an hour after 9.03 more than a half an hour after we all knew that these were deliberate attacks. By 9.35 or 9.40, a lot of us, maybe most of us, were now aware and watching TV, listening to the radio, getting information. So when the people on Flight 93 make their phone calls to their loved ones just to tell them they're on a hijacked plane, their loved ones are telling them, look, they are flying planes into buildings. You have to do something. You have to try to take the plane back. That's the difference with Flight 93. Because of the delay in Newark, because of the delay with the hijacking, by the time they're hijacked, everything in New York had happened more than a half an hour before. So they were able to get the information and then had the opportunity to act. I think we can all agree that if the people on the other three planes had the same information and the same opportunity, they would have done something very similar to what the passengers and crew of Flight 93 did. So again, try to imagine. Your plane drops 700 feet in altitude. Your plane starts flying erratically. You are threatened with a bomb. You are told your plane has been hijacked. And then you find out this is not a regular hijacking. 
You are not going back to the airport. This is a suicide mission hijacking. The passengers and crew of Flight 93 had to come to grips with all of that within the space of less than 10 minutes. Try to imagine. So at this point, I just want to say, bravery is not the absence of fear. Bravery is not the absence of fear. Bravery is acting despite your fear. So what do the passengers and crew of Flight 93 do? They immediately start to make a plan to fight back, to try to regain control of the aircraft. We know that they were going to use the food service cart, probably to bash open the cockpit door. One of the passengers on Flight 93 was speaking with his wife on the phone. He told her of their plan to fight back. Her question was, what do you have for weapons? Probably half jokingly, he said, well, we have butter knives. <laughs> but what did they have? They had the food service cart. They had butter knives. Sandy Waugh Bradshaw, a flight attendant on Flight 93, was boiling hot water to throw on the terrorists. And we know there was a corkscrew. The passengers and crew of Flight 93 were going to use anything and everything they had to try to fight back to take control of that airplane. But before they put their plan into action, one of the most democratic things that could have happened on that day happened on Flight 93. They took a vote. And we have no evidence that any of the passengers and crew voted against fighting back. And if you've ever wondered who among the passengers and crew of, fight, of Flight 93 joined in the fight to try to regain control of the plane, we have evidence that tells us from two phone calls that ended in very similar fashion. Flight 93 passenger honor Elizabeth Wanio was speaking with her mother on the phone. She willingly gave up that phone call to say, I have to go. Everybody is running to the cockpit. Also, flight attendant Sandy Waugh Bradshaw speaking with her husband on the phone, willingly gave up her phone call to say to her husband, I have to go. Everyone is running to first class. Everybody, everyone. Honor Elizabeth Wanio and Sandy Waugh Bradshaw tells us who took part in the fight. One or both of them could have said some of us or a few of us. That is not what they said. They said everyone and everybody. So what were the passengers and crew of Flight 93 up against? Four terrorists. One was the hijacker pilot. The other three were known as muscle men. But these individuals were hardly large, imposing men. They were small individuals armed with only box cutters and small knives. So what were the terrorists up against? The terrorists were up against the likes of six foot four, 225 pound Mark Bingham, a two time national champion rugby player at the University of California. They were up against Linda Gronlin, who knew karate, who was an attorney, who was a skilled auto mechanic and a race car driver. They were up against Toshia Kuge, the Japanese passenger on Flight 93, who had been a linebacker on his American college football team in Japan. I didn't even know they had American college football in Japan, but he was a linebacker. And they were up against the youngest passenger on Flight 93, 20-year-old Diora Francis Bodley, who had been the captain of her high school basketball team. So I don't want you to imagine a mob moving forward on this plane. 
They were moving forward probably single file behind the food service cart down a 20 inch wide aisle on a 757. Shortly after the revolt started at 9.57 a.m. and when the hijacker pilot became aware that the passengers and crew of Flight 93 were coming to get him, first thing he did, he waved the wings left and right, trying to throw them off balance, doing anything he could to keep them out of the cockpit. Then what he did he did what uh, they call a series of porpoise maneuvers, really steep climb, steep dive, steep climb, steep dive, over and over again, trying to keep them off balance, keep them out of the cockpit. There's a lot we don't know what happened in that time on Flight 93. Flight 93 crashed at 10.03 a.m., it came in at 563 miles an hour in a 40 degree dive and um, upside down. When Flight 93 hit the ground at that speed and at that angle, and plus because the ground up here is a little softer than normal undisturbed earth because they stripped coal out of this area for 30 years from the mid 1960s to the mid 1990s. So this ground is a little softer than normal undisturbed earth. So because of the speed of the plane, the angle of the dive and the softness of the ground, Flight 93 completely embedded into the ground. There were still 5,500 gallons of jet fuel on board that exploded. When they did the investigation here, they had to dig down 40 feet before they stopped finding parts of Flight 93, 40 feet into the ground. The investigation here was very important, not only for Flight 93, but for 9-11 also, because here they found the black boxes, the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder also a Pennsylvania state trooper was walking along the tree line. He looks down, he sees a credit card. That credit card turned out to belong to one of the terrorists. So the FBI was able to use that to follow the money. That credit card, a picture of that credit card is on display at our visitor center. On all four planes that morning, the terrorists turned off the transponders, which made them difficult, if not impossible, to track and identify. When flight 90, we are, we are 17 minutes flight time from Washington, D.C., where we are now. Flight 93 would have reached Washington, D.C. at um, 10.20 a.m., when Flight 93 crashed, it wasn't like the whole world knew because FAA could not track it. And it was quite later in that morning before they realized the crash here was Flight 93 and that it was connected with the other crashes on 9-11. It wasn't until 11 minutes later at 10:14 that the FAA first notified the military that Flight 93 was a hijack. At that point, they still did not know that Flight 93 had crashed. Several minutes later, because the military was busy, the military gets back to the FAA requesting location information on Flight 93. The military didn't know where it was at either. Of course, FAA never responded to the military because they didn't know where Flight 93 was. Flight, like I said, Flight 93 would have reached Washington, D.C. at 10.20 a.m. It was determined later that the city was unprotected at that time and was not protected until later that morning, which means Flight 93 would have reached its target. We don't know for certain what the target was for Flight 93, but we believe it was the Capitol for some very strong reasons. One is just that the Capitol is a large building, sits up on a hill, so a fairly easy physical target. Two is that 9-11 was not some random date chosen by the terrorists. 
9-11 was chosen because the House and Senate were both back in session that morning. It was not chosen because of the 911 emergency call number either. House and Senate both back in session that morning. They were the target. We believe they were the target. And then, then fourthly, or thirdly, for what it's worth, we have testimony from captured terrorists who say it was the Pentagon. And then fourthly, um, aviation people say that um, inexperienced pilot, like these hijacker pilots were, they were not trained on how to take off. They were not trained on how to land. And really, they barely knew how to fly these planes. So aviation people say that an inexperienced pilot like that, flying at low altitude, high speed into Washington, D.C., would have been nearly impossible to target the White House. So that's why we believe pretty strongly that the Capitol was the target for Flight 93. So now I'd just like you to think back to the day of 9-11 and the days following. Think back how awful it was to see the destruction in New York, hearing of all the loss of life there, the destruction in Washington, D.C., loss of life there, terrible days, terrible days. If it had not been for the brave, quick, decisive action of the passengers and crew of Flight 93 to fight back on that aircraft, the other thing we would have been watching those in those days would be our U.S. Capitol building in ruins and on fire. We would have been hearing about the loss of life and injuries for many of our government leaders. To say the least, our response to 9-11 probably would have been slower and probably would have been different. It is because of these people on United Airlines Flight 93 that that did not happen, that we were not watching that. So that is why I say we owe them a great bit of our gratitude, our thanks, and our honor. And um, I'd just like to wrap this up by saying recently, uh, ambassadors, uh, park rangers, and other employees of the Flight 93 National Memorial uh, had the privilege to be invited to tour the Pentagon. While there, we heard from a survivor of the 9-11 Pentagon attacks. And what he told us was that in the days following 9-11, Nobody could be sure who among their colleagues and friends had survived and who among their colleagues and friends had not survived. So it became a sort of ritual or a habit that whenever they would see each other, one would say, it's good to see you. And then the other would in return say, it's good to see you too. So I would just like to conclude this by uh, thanking you for your attention, uh, thanking you for coming. I know it's not easy to get here. We are out of the way. Uh, I wanna thank you for uh, coming here to honor the passengers and crew in whatever way uh, you feel is appropriate. And I will conclude by saying, it's good to see you. Thank you. <laughs>